before we get this evening's very special program underway, we wish to acknowledge the land on which the University of Toronto operates for thousands of years. It has been the traditional land of the Huron Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home of Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn and reflect on this land. And so now it's my very great pleasure to get what I think will be a special evening underway. And I want to very briefly introduce our two participants. Um, I'm, I guess I should say, for those of you who may not know, what am I doing here? Why am I here? I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Law, and it is a real perk to be able to um, have these two special guests here and then also to moderate a conversation amongst the three of us. Um, so first of all, I'd like to introduce Shauna Van Prague, who is a professor of law at McGill University, where she has been teaching since 1993 and where we actually were colleagues for a couple of years in the, well, early 90s, shall we say, a few years ago, not all that long ago. Um, she's an active faculty citizen. She's a beloved and committed teacher and mentor and a scholar with a really wide range of research interests ranging from private law, private law of civil wrongs to children in the law, law and religion, and on and on. And she has done something that is perhaps a little unusual for a legal academic, that is, she has turned to writing a biography. And we'll hear a little bit more about this as we go along this evening. And then sitting right next to me is a man who probably needs no introduction. I'm not actually going to give him a lot of an introduction because, well, there is this. We're going to be hearing a lot about him, but you will all know um, Frank Iacobucci, um, currently senior counsel at Tories and has been, I think, for the last 16 years or so. Um, and he has been among many, many things that he's done and that you will hear a little bit more about the justice on the Supreme Court of Canada, a president of U of T, and also, among other things, a dean of this law school. So very welcome back to you as well. And so what we'll do is we'll hear a little bit from the book and have our author read some excerpts from the book to us, and then I will try and um, engage us in a bit of a conversation about some of the themes that are highlighted. And Shana, I give uh, the floor, so to speak, to you. Can everyone hear me? Yes. I, I couldn't pull the microphone and turn pages to find excerpts in my book, so they very quickly and nimbly adjusted the microphones. So um, it's quite overwhelming and really lovely to look out um, at the generations that are here, some of my past students, some of my past teachers, some of the people I studied here with, um, the team at University of uh, Toronto Press that has accompanied me over the last uh, is it a year and a half now. Um, uh, and of course, it's particularly nice to look to my right and to uh, uh, continue our ongoing conversation, Frank, um, and, uh, and uh, to be here with, uh, with Yuta and welcomed by Yuta. Uh, this is, as you all know, a place of meeting, of learning, of imagining. Um, I quote Rob Pritchard at one point in my book talking about how when Frank Yagabuchi returned as interim president, he reminded everyone at University of Toronto that it could be a place of joy and optimism. And that's uh, how I feel about campus-based university in general and about uh, this university where I studied at both University College and the Faculty of Law uh, in particular. At one point, the, um, the working title of this book in my head, I don't think I ever told you this, Frank, was uh, Grazie Mille. And it was all about gratitude, um, partly because I watched Frank um, thank people around him all of the time in heartfelt and, and meaningful ways. And I thought that was quite a remarkable model. Um, I, I actually just recently moved house. And as I sorted some papers, I'm a bit of a pack rat and I'm never throwing anything out. 
I found a letter that I brought along with me to share at the start of uh, today's event. It's from June Sergi. Some of you may know that name. She was the head of the University College Alumni Association. Um, and in June of 1990, uh, she wrote, I think I had probably written her, I was past student president at UC, had written her about the fact that I was off to do graduate work at Columbia. So she wrote, congratulations. And then, and this is why I brought this along, she wrote, talked to Frank I at the Connell dinner Tuesday. He really is terrific and never changes. <laughs> <laughs> Quite remarkable to find that um, in my boxes uh, just last week, um, uh, and I thought I would uh, bring that along. So I'm going to, as you just said, she uh, kindly invited me to share a few excerpts, and uh, in these excerpts, you will hear various voices, Frank's voice, my voice, um, and, uh, and I will talk to you a little bit about how I constructed this book around uh, many other voices as well. Over the past 17 years, and indeed it was 17 years ago that I first talked to Frank when he was here as president, actually, um, about the, my idea about this book. Uh, over those years, many people have asked me what the book was about. And I always actually found that difficult to answer because I was writing about someone who many people knew as a judge, so they assumed it would be a traditional judicial biography. Um, and I wanted it to be biographical without falling into the trap of a judicial biography. So I found it very hard to talk, to explain succinctly what it was about. And it was only this past summer when UTP asked me to come up with a little paragraph saying what the book was about um, that I think I hit on it. And I used alliteration. My past students will know that I love alliteration. So the book is about identity and integrity, teachers and teamwork, responsibility and reconciliation, and the excerpts that I've chosen, and I, I hope, uh, reflect that. So I start right at the very end of the book in the epilogue. One thing that Frank does is ask of everyone he meets, what's your name? Where do you come from? People sometimes associate such questions with an attempt to exclude or an attitude of suspicion or disdain. But Frank's own answers show us how asking those questions is fundamental to making connections, to appreciating the complex and always dynamic identities of human beings in our lives. How do we refer to ourselves? What's in a name? How do we spell it and pronounce it? And where do we come from? What paths have we traveled in getting to where we are? Whose families do we belong to? Of what communities are we members? Most importantly, what are the stories we tell and retell, listen to and share as individuals, as workers, as parents and children, as neighbors, and as entire societies? In the part of the book that I labeled where we come from, I tell the following story. On a very hot Saturday afternoon in July of 2020, I walked out to check on my hanging baskets of flowers. Hesky, the Hasidic Jewish baker of my neighborhood, and his wife, Malki, were paying a Shabbat visit next door. When Malki saw me, she turned to her son and told him to, quote, listen to the neighbor. He says he wants to be a lawyer, she told me, so you should talk to him. Understandably, the boy looked embarrassed. On top of having his mother talk about him to someone he didn't know, I wasn't the kind of person he would feel comfortable talking to. He could barely look up the front stairs at me, a woman in a sleeveless top and shorts, head uncovered, whose only connection to his own community seemed to be the mezuzah affixed to the front door frame. I asked him how old he was. His mother answered. He's 12, <laughs> he said. Almost a bar mitzvah. I wished him luck and congratulations in advance. And then I said that I was writing about someone else who decided he wanted to be a lawyer at the age of 12. This other boy, I said, was the youngest of four children. His parents, who came to Canada from Italy, didn't have any books in their house. That caught the kid's attention. Can you imagine no books? Odds are that a 12-year-old Hasidic boy growing up in Utremont, the neighborhood of Montreal, where 25% of the population lives a strictly orthodox life governed by religious norms, won't become a lawyer. 
There are daunting, even if metaphysical, walls around the community. But the walls are indeed necessarily permeable in an urban setting in 21st century Canada. The extent of that permeability will depend on this boy and others in his generation. What I could do is share Frank's story. What might stay in this young man's head is the idea that someone who was told he had the wrong name, that he couldn't pursue his dreams, grew up to do what he said he would. I didn't emphasize the part about Frank becoming famous. I didn't list his accomplishments. I didn't tell this family about what it means to become a justice of the Supreme Court of Canada. But I did tell them Frank's last name. This young boy might never write it down. And if he does, he probably won't spell it right. <laughs> but I have a feeling that he will remember what it sounds like. Regardless of whether he goes on to study law, that name might end up meaning something important in his life. I think Frank would like the fact that I referred to him in reaching out to someone decades younger, that I could share his story with a young person for whom that story would feel unfamiliar, unusual, and even a little exciting. There is a tangible and undeniable ripple effect reaching individuals and communities not directly situated along Frank's path. Like the young would-be lawyer outside my front door, Frank grew up surrounded by lots of people with families just like his, interspersed with lots of people with very different backstories. On Commercial Drive, an Italian flag marks the Vancouver neighborhood. As you look towards the ocean, you see the mountains behind green, white, and uh, red banners announcing Little Italy. It is a concrete reminder of this site of Italian Canadian community, although the Italian character of commercial drive is sustained primarily through imagination and memory. Frank would have been one of the ordinary people of the neighborhood. His family would have fit the Little Italy designation of this corner of Vancouver. But a few years later, Frank wasn't walking those sidewalks anymore. Once he left Vancouver, he never lived in a home belonging to a space that could be marked by an Italian flag. <clears throat> How did Frank Iacobucci get to his own first day as a law student? As I told you, at the age of 12, Frank had made up his mind he would be a lawyer thanks to the suggestion of his elementary school principal who knew him to be a good talker and fair with his classmates. <laughs> Frank had no clear idea about, it, about what it was that lawyers do, let alone what it meant to be one. For him, his principal's comment just convinced him that at the right time, he would go to school to study law. A few years later, when he shared his plan with one of his undergraduate professors at UBC, his prof's advice was honest and direct. That would be a mistake, he said. <laughs> you don't have the right name. Frank insisted on going anyway. That story is connected to my own reasons for selecting Frank Iacobucci as my central protagonist. He was never my teacher. He wasn't the judge I clerked for. He was never a colleague or a boss. Instead, he was an informal mentor, the person who, as a university administrator, when he was provost, suggested to a young student, me, in a previous incarnation, as I thought I was very important as student president of university college, that I study law. Neither he nor I worried about my funny sounding name. Watching the time, a few more answers. Okay, so this is uh, me recounting uh, Frank uh, Frank's voice. When I was growing up, Frank said, my mother used to make my lunch and send it with me to school. Every day, I would open my lunch box and find a big sandwich overflowing with tomatoes, eggs, peppers, cheese, prosciutto. Those sandwiches were so delicious and so messy and so Italian. They were impossible to eat neatly not like peanut butter or bologna on pre-sliced bread that all the other kids had. I felt like everyone was watching me at lunchtime. There was no way to hide the fact that I came from the Italian family. This is one of Frank Iacobucci's stories. He tells it to describe what it was like growing up Italian in East Van in the 1940s and 50s. He tells it to university students reaching out to young people who have grown up in all kinds of families. I once listened to him tell it to a group of Asian Canadian lawyers, all of whom laughed and nodded their heads at what was obviously a widely shared, if culturally modified experience. 
He tells it to share the mixed feelings of pride, resignation, discomfort, and developing confidence connected to coming of age with a particular community-based identity. Each time he tells it, he doesn't pretend he never coveted those peanut butter on sliced bread sandwiches. And each time he tells it, he conjures up detailed memories that bring to life the look and taste and bittersweet delight of the lunches he carried to school and ate day after day. Frank Iacobucci can't present himself without sharing his stories. Like anyone, Frank chooses the stories he, tell us, he tells us and, and retells. Our stories situate us. They are somehow meant to explore, uh, to explore and explain the actions and decisions taken. The structure of my book reflects, I think these excerpts are all about, of course, identity and introducing integrity. Now the teachers and teamwork part. The structure of my book is as follows. It's in part, uh, three parts that uh, trace um, a story, another story that Frank often tells, a story of walking past three workers and asking what they're doing. The first worker says, I'm cutting stone. The second worker says, I'm making $5 a day. And the third worker says, I'm building a cathedral. So the book is structured in three parts. Cutting stone, which I've turned into welcome to law, and it starts with the dean's speech that welcomes students to the study of law. Part two, $5 a day, lawyering in the world, a part that starts with the convocation speech when we wave law graduates off into the world and hold our breath to see all of the ways in which they will make $5 a day with their law degree in hand. And part three, building a cathedral called to action, where we start with a class reunion as people come back years after they have left law school and reflect and share on what it means to serve as a jurist. And I take um, lessons from Frank's life and contributions there as uh, lessons for legal education. And the $5 a day, as you can imagine, that's the bulk of the book, um, because in many ways, Frank Eppabucci is a great choice if you're thinking about what you can do with a law degree, because he's done pretty well everything. Um, so he's, of course, worked as a corporate lawyer. He has drafted law, thought about policy and law as deputy minister of justice. Um, and uh, he has taught law. He has been a leader in university. Um, he has been chief justice of the federal court, justice of the Supreme Court in the job that he held down for the longest time, which was 13 years. I talk about how there's a joke in the Yakabuchi family that he can't hold down a job because he kind of jumps from position to position. Um, but the Supreme Court did uh, part did um, last uh, for, uh, for 13 years. Um, I think uh, in the interest of moving sooner rather than later into the conversation, I won't read little bits from those different parts of uh, Frank's life um, and ways in which uh, he has made $5 a day or a little more, I hope, Frank, um, <laughs> <laughs> over the years. Um, but I do want to uh, share one of, I think, my favorite one of my favorite parts um, of the book that is actually entitled Less Than Five Dollars a Day, Nancy Yakabuchi as a Lawyer. In the fall of 2019, there was a knock at my office door. A student wanted to talk with me. A few months before, she had heard me give a lecture to the entire first year class at McGill based on the stories of the Honorable Frank Yakabuchi and the many paths made possible by legal education. I invited her to sit down and ask how I could help. I've been thinking a lot about Nancy, she replied. This is Frank. Everything I have done takes a backseat to the support, guidance, and love that Nancy has given to me. It is my spouse and offspring that dominate my universe, not the law. I always had a concern, Frank continues. I even felt guilty. Some of her classmates called her Nancy, what a waste because she chose to stay home and not to practice. When I shared this quote in my lecture to the first year students at McGill, there had been a collective and audible gasp. 
The fact that classmates could be so mean to each other was hard to digest. Upon reflection, as the student who came to my office had realized, it was even more troubling if Nancy What a Waste was meant to be less insult than observation. Did Nancy waste her time in going to law school? Was it a waste for her to expend so much energy as a law student? Why bother to do the work required to succeed so spectacularly if she wasn't going to sustain a career as a lawyer? Did Harvard waste its resources in providing a legal education to someone who became only a wife, mother, and grandmother? The questions force us to scrutinize the assumption that the purpose of law school is to lead students to recognizable careers as lawyers. When I go on, what is the value of a law degree? The fact that much of the practice of law might not require a formal legal education at all, combined with Nancy's story of learning law but not pursuing a lifelong career in practice, prompts a renewed and revitalized understanding of where a legal education can lead. There is no clear-cut choice between, on the one hand, a job clearly recognized as that of a lawyer, and on the other, a life spent doing nothing law-related. If we adopt a broad concept of law as a way in which human beings create and sustain communities, then studying it informs an extensive panoply of life options, options that include and can go well beyond the concrete $5 a day job titles held by someone like Frank. I don't know what my student will go on to do after graduation, neither does she. Thinking about Nancy might help her question what can feel like an inexorable hierarchy of ways to work as a jurist. Thinking about Nancy might remind her that a legal education hands for a broad range of possibilities for living a life, not simply earning a living as a jurist. And I want to just um, finish off with a piece from the Building a Cathedral part. Um, the whole section on Frank as a Supreme Court justice is kind of provocatively put into the $5 a day section of the book, not the building a cathedral, which is what people might expect. Um, instead, the working turned off my mic somehow. <laughs> Frank to the rescue. Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, the cathedral part, the building a cathedral is actually devoted uh, primarily to Frank's work on as um, negotiator representative of the federal government and the residential school settlement for Indian residential school survivors and also to Frank's work as a mentor. Um, and uh, towards the end of the part on um, building a cathedral, and the third worker who says uh, that what he's doing is not so much cutting stone or making $5 a day, but building a cathedral. And so I say the following. <clears throat> um, the humility that infused the job didn't mean cathedral builders weren't aware of their individual value in a collective and ambitious project. Skilled stone cutters who carve their mark on every stone they cut. This was at first just a way to keep a calculation of how much they were owed. It was like saying this is, you know, um, ensuring their five dollars a day. As these makers' marks became more elaborate, they transformed into a sign of pride and a way to ensure an everlasting signature. <clears throat> so, um, the story of someone who builds a cathedral, a story traced by Maker's Mark, is thus both mundane and special, potentially invisible, but very visible if you know where to look. Frank Iacobucci's story is the same. He is both ordinary and extraordinary, sometimes noticed, sometimes behind the scene. Stone cutter, wage earner, and cathedral builder combined, Frank has carved his signature on a wide range of stones and in an equally wide range of styles. Some stand out in the design of the finished building, others form the base hidden from view. Also like the stone cutters of past centuries, Frank has never accepted true retirement and the accompanying and expected transformation from builder to observer. <clears throat> Um, people who talk about Frank, and there are many of them in this book, 
describe all of the things he has done. Uh, here I quote Janice Stein, were I to be asked whom I admired most as a Canadian, who best represented Canada to me, I would answer in a nanosecond, Frank Yacobucci. And then she goes on to say, I actually, I think there's an untranslatable word that describes the kind of person that Frank Yacobucci is. He is quite simply a mensch. Being referred to as a mensch, a person who acts with integrity, decency, and kindness is an honor not tied up with lists of achievements or completed projects. Frank would get that it is no less complimentary. Another set of words from yet another tradition, and here's where I'll finish off, seems to be particularly a uh, particularly good fit for Frank. These are terms used for people who make individual marks as they build something much bigger than they are. They are labels that depend on what others see in you and how they count on you. They are names for individuals who continue to learn with humility. They are the words found in Anishinaabe tradition for elders. In the Ojibwe languages, a number of terms apply to elders. These are the opening sentences of the book, Honoring Elders by Michael D. McNally. He says, the primary term is Bichi Anishinaabe, great person, nothing short of the paragon of humanity, comma, a mensch. The word mensch, it turns out, does have its equivalent in other idioms. Perhaps the nicest aspect of turning to the role and importance of an elder is that the words for old man and old woman are equally complementary. If, as in the case of Frank and Nancy, both grandmother and grandfather are also jurists, then the different paths they take in law merge through this vocation as teachers. It is not clear whether either Frank or Nancy could be considered an elder. What is clear is that Frank as grandfather coexists with Nancy as grandmother. Each relies on the other. Perhaps only together might they be recognized as elders, constantly practicing what it means to be wise, what it means to teach and guide and support others, and what it takes to be honored. Thank you so much, Bonnie. You've given us uh, a, a really, lot. You know, you've given us glimpses that are, um, you know, natural entry points into the conversation we were about to have. But also, if there are, is anybody in the audience who hasn't yet read the book, um, I think really these were brilliant teasers because what it shows is that this is a very personal book, a very spirited book, an insightful book and uh, something that is beautifully written. So we will now um, open the pages a little bit more, I hope, in, in conversation. And I wanted to start asking you, Shauna, as the author, um, something that I alluded to at the beginning in, in my introduction, that is, as legal academics, we write in a certain way. Of course, there's different styles of legal scholarship, but we write, legal writing is quite different from, say, writing a novel, or um, it's also different, I assume, from writing a biography. And um, that is true even when the biography traces the life of the lawyer, as it does in your case. So I, I, you talked about this, you read um, passages that um, give us kernels of the answer, but I'm hoping to draw on a little bit more about um, what has shaped your choice of writing this book and has shaped um, the approach that you took to the task? And then um, I guess more specifically, what prompted you to write a biography, first of all? And it may be that the answer is actually glaringly obvious um, given everything that you've already said, but um, I, and then building on this, you've also given us clues to this already. So what has, what you said you were trying to find a different way of writing this than just a narrative of all the things that Frank accomplished in his life or his life sequence from you know his childhood to um, where we are now. So how did you how did you zero in on the particular approach that you ended up taking? And then um, as you were doing the writing, what struck you most? What were you grappling with most? What was hardest to do? And the last thing would be, what's the audience? 
And I'll repeat those questions in case you get lost. Yeah. <laughs> got notes. You got notes. All right, there we go. I don't know that my microphone is working. Um, can we have the our friends from tech back here? Is we can also just if activate. You have maybe, a handheld one. I could. Is that, did we give yeah, the handheld one back? Right. That's probably still working. I'd like to use the handheld one for now. I have someone who can see with help. Just make sure that the other. I want to take that off so we don't have it twice. I say I could yell like I do with the students. Talk to them that, but but I know you need that. You need me on it. Yes, okay. because we I know. Long I, know. Long I know. Uh, okay, so uh, that was a multi pronged question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, fair enough, and probably something that, um, that we as law teachers often do to our students ask a question and they all get ready to answer. And then I'm we had another one, one, and then another one. A, B, C. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, okay, so I think I would start by. Um, resisting a little bit a, a too fixed picture or image of how legal academics can write or should write. Um, I think I want to claim at the same time my identity as a legal academic and this kind of writing as situated in law. Um, there's a lot of... Um, and there are parts in here that I make up, right? There are these kind of creative or imagined moments and passages in the book. And I think I actually often tell my students that, you know, without creativity and imagination and a little storytelling, they're not going to be very good jurists, actually, and they're not going to be very persuasive. And I'm not saying that this, um, this kind of writing replaces uh, the writing that we all learn to do in memos, scholarly articles, factums, et cetera. But I think it's all on the same spectrum. Um, but I also think as people tell me that my writing is different, but not just in this book, but over the last 30 years, different than what they often read in law journal articles uh, or in in other legal writing. I, I often wonder about that. And I think that the writing that I do probably maps onto teaching uh, in a way that that isn't as typical in terms of how we write things down. Um, so that there's a, a um, and this is a theme through the book, this kind of conversational feel to the writing, a back and forth and incorporating other people's voices. Um, uh, bringing Frank's voice in, of course, from uh, many hours, many lovely visits to Toronto and um, these conversations that we had, but then allowing other people in his life whose projects and paths have been touched by his to have their lines or sentences or paragraphs or even sometimes pages uh, inserted into uh, into the book. So it's a little bit more like a, a collage as a biographical narrative uh, rather than a linear story. <clears throat> I want to just illustrate what you what you mentioned um, and what I kind of chose not to do, but of course it's there in the book. Uh, and I, I, I talk about the different ways in which I could have related and, and conveyed a sequential narrative of Frank's contributions over his career, because we could abbreviate that to a chronological list of the kinds of jobs or, or a list of the types of roles or responsibilities. Or as I say, we could enumerate various ways in which people have addressed Frank over the years. Mr. Yakabuchi, Dean Yakabuchi, President Yakabuchi, Deputy Minister Yakabuchi, Dr. Yakabuchi, Counsel, Mr. Justice, Chief, Mr. Chair, my Lord, Dad, uh, and to his grandchildren, Gucci, and my favorite that I've held on to for almost 40 years now, Professor Yakabuchi, which I really wanted to hold on to. That's probably because that's how I'm known to so many people now. That's the career that I have um, 
dedicated my life to. But that's, I think, this uh, a connection that I make right back to the fall of 1984 when um, Frank as provost uh, was sent by the president's office as the substitute for President Connell to speak to the first year class at University College. Uh, and I had I got up and spoke to them first because I was the student president. And then he got up and spoke to them. And then he sat down next to me and he turned to me and I was 19 and he turned to me and said, said was I okay? <laughs> and I just thought, that's incredible. This person who's the provost of the university just checked with me whether he was okay in giving this address for the first year students. And so we chatted. And later as a very smart university administrator, I got a little note inviting me to uh, become a student member of the academic affairs committee that he was chairing. Uh, and all of us in academia have done this, you know, when you have an opportunity to make a connection with a student, then you see what that student can do for you, right, and, and how that student can serve. And so uh, I served on that committee, and the following year, when I really wasn't sure what to do with a degree in physiology with a minor in English, I said to Frank, you know, what do you think? And he said, well, you might enjoy law school. And then he said, and this is something that I repeat to my first year students every year. And if you don't like it, if you really hate it, you can leave, quit, you don't have to do it. And I thought, okay, I'll try it. And so that's what I did. And so um, that doesn't, it's not like at that moment, I thought I'll write a book about Frank Iacobucci, but I did notice, and I thought I was very special in this, uh, you know, that I kind of, um, thought in being mentored by this person. So I, I'm kind of special and isn't that lovely and he's giving me some advice and I will follow it. I had no clue then that there were all kinds of people, right, particularly on this campus who felt that they were very special to Frank and mentored by Frank and had followed advice that Frank uh, had offered. And it was many years later, as I had kind of watched his career, watched he, what he had done, and he retired from the court. So, of course, people were celebrating him as a judge as he left the court. And I thought back in the fall of 2005, as he came back uh, to U of T, I thought maybe I could do something a little different. And I had, you know, by that point, I had been a law professor for a while. I thought I could talk about all of these different jobs that he's done. Um, but I. I always wanted, even if I couldn't really articulate it 17 years ago, I really wanted to focus on that um, title that I knew him best as, which was Professor Yakubuchi, and to explore, and it took me many years because I was learning and developing my own understanding of what I was doing as a teacher, but I wanted to explore that as um, uh, a central um, uh, in the book. Have I done enough answers? No, I know there's the, 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 the sub-D, yes. which was, yeah. so who's the audience yes. that you imagine? I know, I know that's the one I hadn't got to yet. You've done. Uh, I'm a pretty good student. I, uh, oh, pay attention. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the target audience. So, um, well, here, interestingly, this was my mom who helped me out with this because I was having a lot of difficulty a few years in about kind of getting the right audience in my head. And I was losing a lot of sleep worrying about colleagues in legal academia who would read this book eventually if I ever finished it and say, well, that's not very academic or right, it's not very serious and scholarly. And my mother said, well, why don't you write it for young people? Why don't you think about inspiring young people who might or might not study law? And that really helped uh, me imagine to whom I was speaking. Of course, as the book came out, and I've talked to UT Press about this, it's hard to imagine how many 20 odd year olds, you know, who's buying books and who's reading books. But, um, but I thought I, I'd like this book of course, this book, I hope, will speak to people who know Frank already, who know his name, who will be interested in the book because Frank Iacobucci already means something to them. And I knew that there were a whole lot of people who fell into that category. But I also hoped that it will, might, if read by them, appeal and, and uh, to and inspire people who've never heard of Frank Iacobucci. Um, and who were looking 
for some some um, some inspiration about how to make contributions uh, in particular to Canada, to Canadian society, whether with a law degree or not in hand. And I thought you to, that in response, I would just actually, if you allow, read a, another little excerpt that's not my voice, but a voice of one of my past students. Um, and here she is, Debbie Yaboa, at the end of her first year in law. When I think of, um, uh, she, she talks about when I think of Justice Frank Piacucci, what comes to mind is a story that I tell as I teach towards. I'm not going to go into that uh, this evening. Um, but she goes on, during my first year of law at McGill, I felt like I had been thrown into a whole new world. I grew up in a house almost completely absent of talk of Canadian law or politics. My parents are Ghanaian immigrants. And before I came to McGill, I did not know anything about how the law worked. I did not know any judges or professors. I didn't know lawyers. It's strange, but there are still moments where I look around and feel as though this is not the place for a person like me. At times, I feel like I do not belong. The fact that Justice Yacobucci, a child of immigrants, served on the Supreme Court of Canada resonates with me in a special way because it shows me that this world is not so far away. People like me are part of it. I do belong. His legacy is a concrete reminder that this law world can be the place for the children of immigrants as well. And there is real comfort in that for a nervous first year student. It's an answer. Thank you. So let's let's move on to the um, man that you've written about and um, that uh, sits in the middle here between us. So uh, there's many questions I could ask you, uh, Frank. Obviously, um, but I'm I'm one thing I'm interested in, given especially given this conversation um, about the role of mentors and teachers and inspiring young people and so on. So in, in the book, at some point, Shauna says that by the time you are in the president of the team, you've accumulated leadership skills in the university context, the government context, the judiciary, and, and, and. So I'd be interested to know from you what you think makes a good leader. And I want to ask that in particular with respect to young people. So what would be the advice that you might give to young people who want to be leaders, but who may not think they're cut out to be leaders? And generally, what advice is there um, if one would like to be a leader, but really um, isn't quite so sure as to how to get there? Um, well, can you hear me? Yes. First of all, I, I went to preliminary. <laughs> Please. Uh, that's what I want to thank you for having this gathering. It's important uh, for me to acknowledge that for many reasons, personally, institutionally. Oh, okay. Yeah, you may have to hold it a little closer. Is this better now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I, I thank you. I want to thank, at the same time, I want to thank uh, the law school and the university. I wouldn't be here, none, none of you would be here without the influence that I got in huge, huge quantities from me. University of Toronto in the back of the Simple as that. That means I thank the colleagues and former students of this place uh, for what happened in my, uh, in my life. That's, uh, that brings me uh, to thank you, Shauna. Shauna, uh, I can't thank her enough. So, to conclude on that, but also to say she did it while she was raising three very talented boys who are not young men, basically, uh, and after the uh, schedule of contributions to the law school, to the university, and to the fields in which she's a scholar. So I thank you to her. I won't repeat it before all of you. So uh, I'm 
was to thank you. And I can't, in many ways, the most important was to the last. It's not part of your question. Well, there was going to be one about it, so you're answering it. But to get to your answer about leadership, there have been books written on it. I, I can't encapsulate it, but I'll, I'll say what I believe. And that it, it seems to me that Take on leadership. Number one, you, you have to have a passion for the mission of the group, the organization, the institution that you're talking about. Maybe. Passion's got to be a mission. Because it really is why you're doing it. You want to make it better. The second, to me, the quality. Is empathy. Uh, empathy, not in a sentimental. Is everybody here? Can you hear me? Can I, okay. It's, well, the second quality is empathy. In my mind, a, a, a empathy, putting yourself in their shoes uh, when you're leading. How would they react to this? So how, how can you be informed by them? It's looking beyond yourself to the people that you will be leading. And I, I, I think we see successes and failures just on that factor alone. I think the third component of leadership, leadership, because leadership, I think, has changed over the over decades. It used to be we, my generation grew up in a, as a leader in a very autocratic way. They stayed in their positions for decades and decades. And, uh, and you just can't sustain that. And no human being can sustain the quality of leadership if it's just becomes a senator. So that leading a team, the team plays a great role in. Because really, leadership, to my mind, is broken down into the people that are leading. They all have to play a role. They have to play a role in, and that also won't be an effective relationship. Do you want to inch on it, it looks like, or? Of course. Of course. <laughs> Did I even ask? There you go. But I don't think Frank's finished. Well, I, 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 I was going to go to the second part of your, your second uh, question, but your point is you can wait. You have your own people. That's the way I, I can give for the young people. First of all, in, in planning, our components of career involvement. Uh, you can't say, I want to be a leader uh, you know, at the beginning of a career, or even well before that. I think the best advice I can give is to be the best at your work, best at what you've chosen to do. And that will be an ingredient of great importance to becoming a leader. Uh, and, and don't think that planning is the most important part. When you think about things that really make a difference in your life, uh, think about how it can be. And that's usually providential. It's not planning. I mean, there's a certain amount. We met, we met uh, in England. But how we got there was really providential. So I always feel you know, providence and ultimately can trump planning. I don't think we should plan, but but you can plan to be a leader and you plan, but you can plan to be as good at your work as you possibly can. Wonderful. Yeah. 
So I'll just jump in for one sec before I pass it over to you, because what this kind of uh, makes me think is that, Shauna, you said earlier, um, referred to the fact that there's been this line that Frank can hold down the job. I think the answer actually is exactly in what you, it's, it's not that, it's more that you were so good at what you were doing in each instance that somebody had already made another plan for you um, in, in the next um, stage of all the different things that you've done. And then there's also one thing that stuck out for me. I hope I remember this correctly. I think you quoted John Maskin somewhere who said, I never thought that a course in big biz org was about human relations because even in the teaching, I think the empathy and the human dimension um, uh, came out. And so I think it's all very consistent with what uh, with the passages that Sean has already read. So it's interesting on the corporate law part because some of my colleagues are surprised that I could write about Frank as a corporate law professor because I'm not a corporate law professor. So I don't teach business organizations or business associations. Um, it's interesting about some law schools call it, call it biz org and others biz as. Um, but uh, in um, talking with Frank, looking at his, not just his teaching in the classroom, but his teaching through course materials that were then used by students throughout the country, um, that I think he, he uh, illustrates how it's not about the title or the substance, even the substance of a course, it's about what you do with it in terms of providing an opportunity to think about how to empathize with individuals, with communities, with their projects, um, and uh, to listen to each other in the classroom and to, uh, and to really delve into whatever context or domain you're studying. But on the leadership front, what Frank didn't talk about was something that I, I just loved listening uh, to you reflect on over our conversations, Frank, which was your time as a little young soccer player. <laughs> because and I and I quote Frank saying, I was a good little soccer player, small and fast, and a playmaker. That was my job to make the play. And I uh, take that and I take it very seriously. I think you kept making the play um, uh, in an important way, job after job. The playmaker has to be a talented player and a generous member of the group, willing to pass to teammates and above all trusted by the others. The goalkeeper might have the potential for stardom that carries a particular and lonely responsibility. The role of principal scorer comes with intense flashes of fame and accomplishment. It's the playmaker in the middle of the field who helps ensure the success of the whole team. Um, and and this goes to what you were saying, Yuta. I, I say, you know, respected as a remarkable administrator in every context in which he served, from the university to the federal government to the federal court of Canada, Frank never actually applied for most of the jobs at which he excelled. Instead, it was all about who he knew, not in the sense of a network into which he had been born or through which he had grown up, but rather via relationships he had built uh, and nourished. Um, and I also take very seriously your story about getting an own goal right? <laughs> and not failing because that wasn't failure, but it was loss and it was something from which you had to pick yourself up. We've talked about this and keep going. Um, and and uh, I say he sometimes made mistakes most painfully with an own goal, but mostly he saw the field, watched for opportunities, and facilitated the best game possible on the part of his teammates. And I think that that uh, captures an approach to leadership that is really quite remarkable and consistent over what almost... Uh, when were you at? Don't, don't, don't oh, no, we won't. No, we're a little bit of time. It underscores the point that Frank made about leadership being a team business yeah. as well. Yeah. Okay, so then let me try something a little bit more substantive about the law. I had a couple of those, but I'm going to limit myself to one. <clears throat> First to Shauna, and then maybe to see what 
Frank has to say about this. So there's one passage in the book where you discuss Frank's judgment in law, um, and you flag what you call, and here I quote, the need to question the desirability or at least to appreciate the perils of unanimous, unanimous Supreme Court decisions. And that might strike some people as perhaps counterintuitive. So I was interested in hearing a little bit more about what you had in mind when you said that. Uh, sure. Um, so we're not going to take this opportunity to go into detail about particular judgments. Um, in that particular that case, uh, Frank wrote for a unanimous court. But earlier in the part on his five dollars a day as a Supreme Court justice, I actually trace the um, path from a dissenting opinion wrote with colleague Justice Corey, so on a little team, um, uh, about freedom of association and watch how that voice and that description of uh, connections between human beings in terms of understanding the promise and the potential and the importance of freedom of association kind of moves from a dissenting space into a uh, um, into a story that really illustrates that centrality of understanding human beings in that connected way and, and earns Frank, interestingly, great um, praise and admiration by labor law scholars. So, uh, so Frank's own work as a Supreme Court justice illustrates sometimes this significance of dissenting opinions. Um, I do write that the clarity and apparent finality of a unanimous judgment can turn out to be anything um, but. That is, it can risk the creation of a major pothole. In a 1994 House of Lords judgment, albeit in the relation on the relationship of tort to contract, Lord Goff warns against what he strikingly referred to as the temptation of elegance. The aim of clearing up confusion by producing a sophisticated and streamlined set of guidelines for the future development of the law uh, can backfire. Um, partly because, as I also emphasize in the book, no judgment, as we know, even the Supreme Court of Canada judgment is the last word. And so while the job of the Chief Justice is indeed as much as possible, and in particular on important cases where the court writes as the court, it may well be important to kind of come together and agree. Um, we all know that dissenting voices can also really um, sharpen the uh, 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 majority judgment and can help us see how a particular area of law will, will evolve as we go forward. So I, I think it's tied to um, um, what I also emphasize in the book as a kind of broader understanding of who all the participants are in conversations in which the Supreme Court is a speaker. That um, it is that the judiciary and the, and, um, the policy makers uh, in the a dialogue that Frank has written about and talked about but I think it goes beyond um, those participants as well. Thank you. So Frank, do you have some reflections on this? Well, I, 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 I do. Uh, just talking about the law case on equality, um, I, I have uh, no hesitation in saying that it was an attempt to try to bring different approaches that the court was demonstrating in the, in the jurisprudence to try to bring them together, to synthesize uh, by bringing the different approaches together, because after all, uh, the work has to be interpreted by other courts, uh, and, and uh, there was some confusion, but which, which uh, flavor approach was going to be the one to uh, Died. And and so that that was the nature and the goal of that judgment. And I think that's a proper role for a Supreme Court to to try to do when you see jurisprudence that's 
It's just getting conflicting messages. But it's, it, 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 it shows, it shows, it really demonstrates why some countries don't allow dissenting judgments. Now, I'm not in favor of that, for which with reasons that you mentioned. But there, there are times when the unanimity is very important. And I give to me one of the most important cases that I certainly participated in was the Quebec secession reference. For, for the court to have been played on that would have been very unfortunate. Uh, we went to great pains uh, to, for example, have only the Chief Justice ask questions that we would develop in the conference among ourselves so that there would be no interpreter to sort of, uh, if you like, in, in sizzling, flashy journalism or media coverage that would say, well, why did that judge ask that question, et cetera. And it, 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 it was a proper occasion. We're talking about really national issues of great importance to our country. Um, so that's where I think uh, we work very, very hard at, at the hardest in my uh, time there uh, of, of trying to keep uh, uni unanimity as the goal. Um, and uh, Whereas uh, in, in the organic nature of law, I mean, this is every law student first year gets this, that you know, the traditional expression of the descents of the present become the law of the future. I think that's an overstatement, <laughs> but, it, but it is, it, it, it's very important because. It, it does recognize the organic nature of law. And that uh, is what we believe in uh, in this country, that things are, uh, 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 are ongoing and evolving. Um, it's interesting that uh, when you look at your own work and you realize your shelf life is about, you know, not big, it, it's all your judgments are about that. That, that kind of size of emotional, and you don't get upset uh, when I, I looked at some of the work I did has been uh, modified, uh, and, and, and that's the way. That's, there's nothing wrong with that. that that's 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 the way in which we we get better through the that organic nature of of, of law, and, and much of that is. Who, in the sense, I think the real target, and I'm any judge who says he or she is not guilty of this, I certainly was guilty of, of concurring judgments. They're the ones that are really quite mischievous <laughs> because it sometimes it's just wanting uh, to talk, but not really saying much. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, I have to admit to my own uh, uh, defects in a couple of the cases that I would like to change uh, uh, opportunity to do so. But uh, all this to say that uh, uh, I, 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 I think uh, uh, a career out of being a dissenter. But if you just uh, ignore the importance of these things, you won't have a strong, uh, a, the strongest set of jurors, a, a strong uh, a set of really making uh, the law as organically progressive and uh, do that interesting. I think that, that if I can just jump in, I think that really ties back into the responsibility of teachers in a classroom to work with that complexity. Because one of the things that law students love is the unanimous judgment, right? With guidance and rules and a structure. And then they have a hard time 
reading the next case that seems to kind of change that and they're not sure what to do with it. And they're really not sure what, well, as first year students who come up at the end of the class and say, why is it we have to read the dissenting judgment in that? Like, what are we, if, it, if it's not the law, why do we read it? You know, it's all the law, which just is an invitation to complexity, but not, as you say, not complexity for the sense sake or just to be difficult, but to appreciate that, that um, how students themselves and then the jurists they will become are invited in as participants in that development uh, of law moves forward, whether it's in the courts or in, in all of the sites in which, in, in which we work on law. Well, this is really a joy to listen to you. And I think I don't speak just for myself. I could continue this particular conversation a very, very long time. Mm -hmm. I'm going to give up the many other questions that I had for you because I do want to give everybody in the room a chance maybe for two or three questions for either Frank or Shauna or both. And um, there is somebody there who can run to you with a microphone so that everybody can hear. Please. Who would like in? Yes, please. And so, briefly say who you are, so everybody. Good evening. Uh, my name is John Campion. Um, Professor Yakabuchi was uh, a teacher of mine, as as Dorothy would know. So hold it a bit closer. Is that better now? Thank you. So I quickly tried to get through half of the book, uh, sitting here and listening. And I, one thing I know is it's very well written. But I was looking for some themes. One was personal ambition, which Professor Trevelko dealt with in a ping pong setting. Yes. And the other one was um, a single line or a single theme that might run through your judgments. And what I read was human dignity. Can you comment on one or the other, the notion of competitiveness and the notion of human dignity in your judgments? I think that's for you, Frank. Wow. <clears throat> I do carry those themes through the book. <laughs> well, I, I, uh, I'm of, of the belief that dignity is about as important as human component quality that we have in the, in the world of the charters. What, what did I do? What did I do? Well, oh, I mentioned dignity. Um, the teacher, for example, that has the clause on the provision on dignity that is inviolable. You cannot compromise it. There's no section one of the charter in the initial dignity. And I mean, I think says dignity is the mother of all rights. So I, I do believe that that is something in the what we mean in the quality. And that's in, the law uh, judgment that was unanimously agreed to. So it, it really is a, uh, in the law, I believe, is a, a, a quality that really is extremely important for our freedoms and role the individual versus the state. Thank you. All right. Yes, please. Hi, it's okay. I don't need I, My name is Paul Monahan. I was going to ask you, uh, Justice Jacobucci, you talked about mentorship. Who, who were your mentors and, uh, and and what did you learn from them? And, and if you so just that. for anybody online who may not uh, have heard, who are your mentors, Frank Jacobucci and well, I, I, you know, it's kind of corny, but uh, there are thousands of them almost, it seems to me. I, 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 my school teachers, school teachers, I got the strap the first day of school. 
you look at the strap, it was the ruler. So I, why? Because I, uh, had, we had scrapers, and uh, I, we would, the teacher told us to uh, open in our books to the first page, and this, this my fellow student across the aisle took his crayon and made a big mark on it. <laughs> and she turned around and saw me in the lobby, and, <laughs> and so was punished. But she never asked me why I bought them, and she never asked me that. And then after she gave me the three hits on the hand, each hand, uh, she asked me, and uh, I, I told her, she went down to see my book and asked the uh, offender, uh, did they do it? And she said, he said yes. And uh, she really was very, very contrite, very upset, asked me to do the brushes at the end of the day. So <laughs> that was my reward. I could pick somebody, I didn't pick the culprit. The <laughs> and, and, and so she became a mentor to me just instantly. And that it was a parade of the teachers to call to uh, encourage them. And at every level of education, I think the one who asked me if, uh, about what I wanted to do, he wanted me to go into statistics because I'd done well in the course to be a statistics professor. We met up years later. Years later, I was dean of the law school, and uh, we said that we had a meeting uh, in Quebec City of the Learning Societies. What? Yes, we switch them for now. I will call IT. I think it's my mic. Anyway, can you hear me? Yes. Sir. Uh, the point is, he. he he said, it's too bad you didn't take my advice and be an assistant professor somewhere <laughs> <laughs> in statistics. Uh, uh, and you, you were a monitor to something. <laughs> <laughs> statistics. In any event, I, I can't. And then the colleagues won, won the breath. Everybody takes turn if you're in, in a really collegial atmosphere. Whether it's a court or a law school or a department of education somewhere in government or whatever, you learn mentors all around you. So I can say quite rightly that I have had so many. I had models. I learned from Marty Friedman, whom I succeeded as dean. I learned a lot from him. But I wouldn't. He wouldn't think of me as being his mentee, but I uh, maybe he might, but I certainly learned a lot. But also from other others, you, you pick up what to do and what not to do. If you pay attention to the people around you, uh, you can learn so much uh, from uh, what you should do and what you shouldn't do. I think this is a wonderful, wise note to end on and to, for me to thank the two of you for participating in this conversation, for you to share your book uh, with us. And I, I believe at McGill, a couple of years ago, there was an event around some of the themes of the book that was called Being Frank. Is that right? <laughs> to be frank. To be frank. Uh -huh. So... Close enough. Uh, I wasn't there. I wasn't there. But my point really was going to be that Frank jumps out of every page of your book. You've captured him beautifully. And we've seen these qualities on display here as well. So to be Frank is something very special. I'm being completely frank here. And I won't go on with you know many variations on that theme of puns that one could come up with, but mostly just thank you, both of you, Shauna, thank you for coming, for reading from the book, Frank, thank you for participating in the conversation. We have some refreshments outside, there is a table, if anybody is now intrigued to find out more um, uh, about the book, um, and I think Shauna has uh, 
time to sign a few of the copies, but also I'm sure I will sign as many copies. As many as as you like. Like. I'm sure that Frank, uh, perhaps not as many questions as you might like to answer, but he'll be out there and very happy to talk to you. So thank you all very much for coming. And I hope that you